This tutorial will give you a step-by-step -step lesson on how to use Vioso to do a camera calibration. The fundamental steps are the same for any type of projection surface, such as white array, vertical, curved screen, grid arrangement, cylinder, panadome, dome, or projection mapping on a semi-flat facade of architecture. Launch Vioso Player, Vioso AnyBlend, or Vioso Integrate. Here is Vioso Player, the projector and display setup will be on the right, and your playlist will be on the left. Click the Calibrate button. This is where you will choose your projectors, type of setup, and camera. If you are using a mosaic, you will notice that not all your projectors will be listed. You can split that mosaic into the number of original projectors. Click the Display Split. Choose your mosaic display output and split that in the same parameters that it was created. Note that NVIDIA called these rows and columns, a row is horizontal, and a column is vertical. Here we are using a 2x2 two two grid, each is 1280 by 800 pixels. Click OK, you will now see your one single display split into individual projectors. If you are using a display splitter like a Datapath FX4 or Matrox combined with a mosaic, you will need to reference the splits based on the display splitter grid, along with the mosaic setup. Now you can choose each of your individual projectors, just click on each one. The reference numbers indicate the vertical and horizontal placement in your split. Then, choose the setup method that closely resembles that of your projection surface. Flat screen is for most flat surfaces or very gentle curves. Curve screen or dome will also apply to panadomes and cylinders. Any surface adds a significant amount of scanning to allow for textures and small architectural elements. Any surface also cannot calibrate beyond what the camera can physically see, so it cannot be used on convex surfaces. Manual calibration does not use the camera, but instead allows you to manually warp your projection together and calculates the blend. Preceding calibration will use all the parameters set in a previous calibration. Next, choose the appropriate camera for your calibration. Finally, you can name your calibration. Choose your display arrangement, this will designate where blend areas will be allocated. A grid arrangement will allow blends in both the horizontal and vertical boundaries of the projection. Horizontal and vertical strips will only enable blends in their respective borders. Next, for best results it is recommended to set a display calibration mask. These allow you to crop off bleed from your projection surface. This will create clean crisp lines contouring the entire projection area. Calibration masks are also used to wipe areas that you want the software to ignore during the calibration process, such as doorways, holes in the projection surface, or significantly overthrown projection. Then, click on Extended Options. You can choose your initial scan pattern size. This is the amount of detail that is used during the process. A higher number means that your dot size is larger and thus less detail. A smaller number creates smaller dots and inherently more detail in the scans. The next item of importance is if you are using a monochrome camera. A monochrome camera allows the system to check RGB values of each projector and assess a slight color correction to the overall calibration compound. Now click Next. Vioso will now initialize the projectors and camera. From here, you will see the view from your camera lens. To help you align your camera for the best position, there are overlay grids that can be used to assist with this. The crosshair grid works best with domes, which is what we have here. The important point is to have the camera looking directly at the center of the entire surface. You will want the projection surface to be in as much of the camera field of view as possible, using the physical location and the manual zoom on the lens. However, in this view you will notice that we are not utilizing the most amount of the camera sensor. Since the camera sensor is responsible for the light detecting, this is much more important. Therefore you may crop some of the image resolution to utilize the most sensor. To do so, click on Format. In the Properties of the camera, click on the tab labeled Image Size. You can check the preset image sizes of 75, 50, and 25%, or you can choose free and set your own image resolution. This may take some practice to get the right number and crop to your projection surface. Use the sliders to change the resolution, you can also click on the slider bar, or use the arrow keys to move more precisely. For the X and Y positions, you want the camera view to be centered, so these numbers will need to be half of the amount that is cropped. Click OK, and you will see the new cropped view. Again, you may need to adjust this a couple of times to get it right. At this scale you can take advantage of physically moving the camera for an exact center placement. Go back into Format to look at the camera properties. 
This time you will want to increase the speed of the camera frame rate. Click on the tab, Timing. Move your frame rate slider to about 90 to 95% of its maximum value. If you are experiencing issues with frame drops due to cable lengths and speeds, you can lower your pixel clock down, this will inherently lessen the available frame rate, more on this in the camera setup tutorial. Click OK. If you are using a camera with automatic functions, it is very important to turn off all auto-sensing parameters such as autofocus, white balance, and exposure. Now you make the camera mask, this tells the system what part of the camera view gets attention during the calibration process. There are three tools for the mask, the click and move tool, the freehand tool, and the paint bucket. The click and move tool is easiest to use. Draw your mask around the perimeter of your projection surface. Get as close as you can and it is better to be inside of the surface than outside. Click and move and draw the mask all the way around. Hold down the Alt key to snap your last line to the first, and double click to close the mask. Use the paint bucket tool on the area outside of your projection surface to mask it. You can save your mask to a file for loading for further calibrations. The mask is inherently linked to the view of the camera, so if the camera moves, your mask will no longer work, and you will need to create a new one. Click, Next. It is time to create the projector masks. Remember, these masks are used to create clean lines around your projection surface and eliminate bleed or doorways in the surface. Check the Show Display Identification box, and the projector that is selected will now show ID text on the output. This way you will know what projector you are working on with the mask. You may load an already created mask from a file. To create a new mask, click on Create Mask for your first projector. A new window will open that has a blank white canvas and a set of tools on the left. To create a new shape, click on the Shape Plus sign. This new shape will also appear live on your projector output. If you need to remove a shape, click on the Shape Minus sign. You can add points to an already created shape. The point will always add clockwise to the point that is highlighted purple. When you add a new point it will be exactly in the middle between the highlighted point and the next point clockwise. You can remove points by clicking on the Point Remove button, and this will remove the highlighted point on the shape. You can change the corner smoothing of a point from linear to bezier, depending on your need of your shape. By grabbing the shape you can move it around in your projected area. Finally, you can move individual points by clicking them and moving them to your desired location. Using the physical output projection, adjust your shape position, shape, size, and corner smoothing to create a clean mask on the perimeter of your projection surface. Once a point is highlighted you can use your keyboard arrow keys to fine-tune the position. You can use the tab key to cycle clockwise through the points of your shape. Alt tab to move counterclockwise. You can save your masks by clicking save and naming the mask. Once finished click on the green check mark. Do this same process on the rest of your projectors. There may be projectors that don't need masks, skip those, but pay attention to the naming of your masks so that they are easy to recall to a particular projector. The projector ID is a good way to do this. Masks are inherent to the projector position, so if your projector is moved, you will need to adjust your mask respectively. Once all your masks are created, click Next. Now it's time for Vioso to do the calibration. All of the projectors will flash white, Vioso is comparing the brightness of all the projectors. The first projector will now display a full white screen with a brightness slider. This determines the common brightness level of all the projectors. However, this is done from the perspective of the camera and may be different from the viewer. You can adjust this later so it's best to let Vioso make the call. Click Next to continue. From here you will need to choose to perform a new scan or load a prior calibration or the last scan, if this is a recalibration. You can also load a save geometry scan. With a new scan, Vioso will send out the bubble pattern. Remember, this is the level of detail that is given to the scan. Increasing this number will make the dots larger and thus less of a level of detail. If you decrease the size of dots, the level of detail is much greater. Dot sizes that are too small become unrecognizable by the system and result in red dots and missing dots. Ultimately, you want good sized dots with a distinguishable pattern and mostly green in color. The margin slider allows you to keep the number of the dots but decreases the size of the dot, this is best used in only problematic cases. You can use your mouse to hover over the preview area to get a zoomed in look at the bubble pattern. 
If you are having problem areas where dots are not recognizable, like around edges or corners, you can crop the dots off by row or column. Crop dot data is then extrapolated from the data of the surrounding dots. This sometimes creates better results than recognized dots, especially if they become blobby. If you cannot get the desired results from the adjustment of the dot details, use the threshold button to go back to adjust a threshold of the pattern data. From here the system will project out a series of lines, you are looking for solid lines that extend the entire projection surface. If the lines start to break up on the surface area, it will have an issue with the dot recognition. Adjust a threshold and line thickness sliders to get the best results. A good balance of medium thickness lines that are solid for the entire surface is the preferred outcome. If the threshold is too low you will get camera noise in the image, and if it is too high, or your line thickness is too much, you will not have distinguishability between the lines. Click next to rescan the dot pattern once again. The default scan pattern is 1.2, increasing the number is an exponential curve, so you will want to stay between 1.2 and 2.2 for most non-textured surfaces. Click next to start the scan. The calibration will now proceed to send out a series of line and dot patterns. It is most important to not interfere by moving the projectors, camera, or impeding the view of the camera, as the software is watching closely this process. It is also crucial not interfere with ambient lighting. This process will take anywhere from 15 seconds to 1 minute per projector depending on the resolution, level of detail, and camera parameters. Once the scan is complete, the projector will display a test image, and the software will give you a geometry scan inspection window. The test image should look complete without missing areas in the projection surface, and the lines in the pattern should look uniform. Black areas or warpy looking lines resulted from a bad detection. There are a few parameters that can be adjusted to achieve a better result, such as the tolerance of the detected missing dots, the extrapolation variables, and surface curvature. The detection of invalid points limit can be increased to extrapolate more information that the camera can visibly detect. The default extrapolation method is tolerant. This method will give the best result on most regular shaped projection surfaces. Next, in a case when full polynomial extrapolation has problems detecting a complex, non-regular, or combined surfaces, partial polynomial method can be used. The extrapolation distance can be set to include the entire display or certain number of dots away. Default setting or whole display of extrapolation distance will complete the extrapolation for the entire projector pixel space. Finally, if the projection surface has an acute curvature you can set this criterion. If you change any of the parameters, hit the recalculate button. Vioso will recalculate the projector analysis and display a new test pattern out of the projector. If the test pattern is correct, you may proceed. The show info button will allow you to review the different elements of the calibration scan, including the bubble or dot image from the camera perspective, the display heat map, and display dot maps. Missing or red dots in these images means that the software did not detect them and has extrapolated the position of the dots. Changing the parameters can help with the physical detection of the dots. It is best practice to try to keep the settings the same for all projectors, this will aid in the calculated blend across all projectors. You may choose to change the test image displayed from the projector. The default test image is best viewed for flat or curved surfaces. You can load a new test image, in this case a dome test pattern. When the image is displayed, you will only see the portion of that image from the full final display. When the test image looks correct, click next to proceed. If you are using a monochrome camera, the system will test the RGB values of the projector for a simple color correction. Vioso will give you one final test pattern for you to confirm, this test pattern is the default image. You have the option to proceed the following projectors without interaction, this will complete all the succeeding projectors using the same parameters you have set with this one. This is recommended only if you have a completely controlled environment, simple projection surface, matching projectors, and less than 5 total projectors. Clicking next will proceed to the next projector in the calibration. Here is an example of dots not detected by the system that can be remedied prior to extrapolation. Clicking on the threshold button, you can adjust the threshold a bit to get clean lines across the projection surface. Clicking next you can now see that the dot pattern is correct, and all visible dots are detected. Finish with the rest of the projectors using the same tools and tips mentioned earlier.
Remember, during the scan, do not interfere with the projection, camera, environmental lighting, or surface. It is during this time that the camera view is most critical. If something out of your control does happen, it is best to do the scan on that projector all over again, starting with the threshold adjustment. Once all the projector scans are complete, the software will calculate the total blending of the entire compound. You will then be presented with this final compound as a single warping grid. At this point you can adjust the test image displayed to appear correctly on the projection surface, such as mirroring the display. This depends on the lensing and camera you are using. You can also do your warping to fit your projection surface here as well, I will show you this in a later step. Press the next button, and this will take you to an overview of the calibration. With this dialog, you can inspect the calibration compound parameters and specifics including the total display pixel composite, amount of display pixels used, and detected overlap size. Press save and finish to save your calibration to your desired hard disk location. Once finished, you will be back to the calibrator window. Notice in the target drop-down you have a new option, this will reflect what you have called your calibration compound, or by default here display compound 388. This is now referencing the compound of all your projectors warped and blended together. Hitting the activate button will now start that compound on your projector outputs. Over in the player window, you may load a test image or video. It is best to load a test image that is the same aspect ratio and size as your projection surface. In this example we will load a dome master format test pattern. Press the play button to display the image. Here is where we will adjust the warping grid to align our content perfectly to the projection surface. On the left are the tools for warping your compound. The first option is the deform or scale tool. Once you select a point on your grid, move the mouse to adjust the image. You may also use the keyboard arrow keys to adjust those points. Selecting the keyboard fine or coarse adjustment will toggle the refinement between moving the point from 1 pixel to 5 pixels of movement per press. The Line Grippers tool will allow you to grab a line position between two points. You may use the Tab key to select the next available gripper or point, or Alt, Tab to go counterclockwise between the grippers or points. Using the Add Rows or Columns buttons will add a row or column, exactly splitting the compound in fractional segments. Removing rows or columns will remove them respectively. It is best practice to start with a warping grid in the simplest form, and add rows or columns as needed as you warp along. Having too complex of a warping grid will make your calibration file size larger, slowing down loading and hooking times. For a dome calibration you will likely not need any size other than a square, like this example. Here is an example of an adjustment to the warping grid for a curved screen. Again, starting off with the minimal amount of adjustment points, then adding more as needed. Fine-tuning each point with the keyboard keys to get exactly to the edges of the projection surface. Be sure to save your project after making any new adjustments to your warping grid. Use the color and blending option to make adjustments to your overall compound. Here you can adjust the compound brightness. You can also make manual modifications to the edge blending over all your projectors. Additionally, you can make some fine adjustments to the black level. Since the blending calculation and correction happens in the color information of each one of the projectors, content that is predominantly black may show banding. This is because there is no color in black. To compensate for this, you can raise the black levels of the overall compound to a very dark gray. However, do this lightly as this will affect the contrast of much of your media. It is best to make this adjustment on actual content that is going to be displayed on your surface with the correct ambient environmental light. Finally, you have the option to add a compound mask. This works similarly to the projector masks, but the mask here could be used to eliminate areas on your surface that you wish to not include with the projection content, such as doorways, windows, or other elements. Again, you may save your mask as a bitmap or XML file. You will also have the option of making adjustments to the projectors individually. With this you can make manual changes to each of the color channels, red, green, and blue. Check the box to join the channels, and you will adjust the luminance. If you used a monochrome camera and checked the option, you will likely notice that the software has already done a small bit of color correction on each projector. 
Finally, you can make edits, add, or remove the projector masks you made at the beginning of your calibration. Once you have made all your refinements, make sure you save your project once again.